Welcome to the 43rd episode of Delika, a podcast between two friends about the latest in politics, society, and feminism in Indonesia and the world. I'm Stephanie Tangkilisan. And I'm Sweden Lee. And this week, we're going to do an update on what's happening in Jakarta right now under the reign of Anis Baswedan and Sandiaga Uno, and also discuss about how this administration's policies are impacted by the upcoming elections next year nationally. We also think it's interesting just to look into what the, what the issues are in Jakarta politically as they reflect the potential trends and ways that politicians are trying to maneuver their way into power next year. Also on this episode, we will be referencing Anis' interview with Najwa Shihab from her show Mata Najwa. She's an amazing Indonesian reporter who really gets to the heart of these issues and tries to get Anis to answer constructively, which, surprise, surprise, he really doesn't. He just goes around the issue. So, without further ado, here's to it. So, do you want to update us on um, our current governor Anis Baswedan's actions in Jakarta? Oh, it still feels weird to call him our current governor, even though it's been a few months now. Not that long, actually. It's yeah, been... it actually hasn't been that long. It feels like the Trump presidency. It feels like it's been quite a while. It feels like we've never experienced a day without this current administration. But it's actually only been about four, almost five months now. Oh, God. And, yeah... It feels like yours. It really um, does. And it's been an interesting couple of months for Anis, I think. The perennial problems of Jakarta, which is traffic and flooding, has continued to impact Jakarta. And as recently as a few weeks ago, Jakarta was flooded all over the place again, including regions that was never flooded before during Aho and Jokowi's um, reign. So obviously people are really frustrated that, you know, Anes rode on the wave of the masses and said that he was going to tackle issues for Jakarta, but the two biggest issues of Jakarta hasn't been tackled. And that has become sort of indicative of what the Anes administration has been like for, uh, in these early months. Um, they've made a lot of campaign promises, really optimistic, ambitious campaign promises, which we've talked about in previous episodes, but they haven't really you know, fulfilled most of them. The only ones they fulfilled recently are the policies and promises that was about stopping or rejecting the previous administration's promises. Like AHO's controversial um, reclamation land policies has been stopped. But that's easy, right? That's just you don't, you know, you just stop the thing. Yep. But a lot of the ideas and proposals that are from scratch, those things are still, quote unquote, the masa pekajian, you know, in, in, the, in the study and research period, which nobody ever says what the timeline and deadline is. And so I think um, recently Anis has dialed back his promises and says that, you know, governing is a lot harder than campaigning. As a lot of politicians do. Anyway, let's backtrack a little bit. What are the campaign promises that he specifically made and and how do you th- why do you think he made those promises to begin with? So I think one of the first one that was very um, popular was the zero down payment program for houses, right? For low income citizens of Jakarta. So basically, Anis's zero uh, rupiah down payment promise is this campaign pledge um, this response to Jakarta's rising housing prices for lower and middle income people. So yep. he said that, and he and his um, partner, uh, Sandiago Uno, has said that in the future, under his governorship, people with low wage, that is below 7 million rupiah or $500 US dollars, um, will be able to start buying houses for zero down payment or rent to buy such houses, mm-hmm. which is considered at that point when he was campaigning quite laughable because how will financially Jakarta be able to afford to do this? He and San Diego Uno were saying kind of, oh, there are cheap housing in Indonesia and like quoted really random housing prices that doesn't really exist in real life. Um, so there was just no financial feasibility plan. And as of now, 
Um, the update is that they're saying that they're kind of figuring it out. And also, like, there was, like, a groundbreaking of a company that will provide these housing, but that's where we are at right now. Yeah, we're still in the early stages, and a lot of economists and scientists are saying that it's fine and well to have zero down payment, but if the minimum wage and the reality of, like, what is a living wage in Jakarta is still low, then people still can't afford these houses, you know? Down payment is not the end-all be-all of the housing problem here in Jakarta. So I think for a lot of people, they thought that Anis and Sandy made this promise mainly just to appeal to the popular space. And now that they're facing the reality of actually making this happen, it is a lot harder than they thought. Uh, But we'll see if that's going to cost them in the future. We still don't know. Right. Um, Basically, another part which people have complained about is that for certain types of DP, 0% or 0% down payment housing, yeah, the down payment may be zero, but they're asking for a really high monthly payment, like to the sum of 1.2 million to 2.1 million rupiah, which is around 100 to $150 a month, which is more than half of the minimum wage in Jakarta. And this is exclusively for people who earn like supposedly 7 million rupiah a month but 7 million rupiah a month is relatively high above the minimum wage in jakarta yeah like minimum wage is 3.6 million or 265 dollars a month so as as listeners as you can hear like i mean there's a lot of complexity in terms of the economics of this but the math doesn't pan out yeah there needs to be a better solution to create affordable housing than just zero down payment and this so almost like stopgap solution right for the cheapest affordable housing which is a one bedroom um it's priced at the lowest is 185 million rupiah um which with the minimum monthly deposit will be paid off in 12 years and that's for a one bedroom that's the cheapest one with the lowest amount of minimum payment most decent housing for any family would be double this amount which means it's like 20 years to pay off and this is supposedly affordable housing for low income. I don't know, man. What do you think? I, I don't even know what the solution is at this point. Um, it's just that we have such inequality in Indonesian society that there must be some better ways to do this. Yeah. It's a multifaceted problem, which does require a solution that's comprehensive. But I think the point is that like it's really bad to promise Things like zero deposit and then like, but you're going to have to pay this for 20 years and give people false hopes. I think that's the problem I have, at least with this campaign promise, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, Anis was actually grilled on this in Matanashua and he was saying, yeah, but because Matanashua is essentially saying like, yeah, they're going to, that's really high and they're going to have to pay this for a while. And he's like, oh, but they will make this sacrifice because they will be able to own this in the future. I don't know, man. If you if half your sa- more than half your salary is going to your rent and you have children and wives to feed, like does this really provide a solution? Because one point two million is really really high. Like I know, uh, most costs or like cheaper housing for people could be five hundred to six hundred a month, which is forty to fifty dollars a month. So it, it just doesn't seem to really you know hit the kind of demographics who really need it the most. So aside from the zero down payment promise, um, one of the promises that was also very popular during the campaign trail, and Anis has actually finished it, is stopping the reclamation activities that AHO previously allowed in North Jakarta. Yes. So basically, uh, for people who are not familiar with the issue of reclamation, people are dredging up more sand onto certain parts of islands north of Jakarta in order to create more land for people to live on, etc. Mm-hmm. Part of this policy has been seen as necessary in order to protect uh, Jakarta from rising sea levels. Another part of it has been a continuous development plan from the time of President Suharto 
aka dictator Suharto, in order to just like raise more money and profits for people he was close to. But this policy has been, it's nationally legal and they've made various promises to developers and um, made numerous studies on this before. So this was continuous from uh, Suharto's time to SBA's time to Jokowi's time. So part of the argument was that like, look, there's been already a lot, large investment in this. If we break the promises here, what will we say to developers and property developers in Indonesia in an economy that's already currently quite fragile? It means that the government cannot be trusted in order to fulfill its promises. And therefore, property developers need to be more bearish and be care- be more careful in terms of like, more difficult projects, which in turn worries economists and um, other political leaders. At the same time, there's like, you can start to see the political tension between the presidency and their ministers and and this government in this issue. And I also think during the campaign trail, as you said, right, the history of this is far longer than AHA, but has been tied so much to AHA that it's almost like, it's become part of the package. Like, if we're going to get rid of AHA, we also have to get rid of this project. And that's certainly what has happened. And he has stopped it. And so, on paper, it sounds like he's fulfilled the promise. But in reality, he might be stifling growth that both not only Jakarta needs, but Indonesia needs, right? Yep. But it's certainly been very popular with his base. And it certainly has improved his electability in the future. So, I'm sure he's more than happy to say that he's done a good job with that. Right. Moving on to some other campaign promises. Uh, one of the campaign promises we've talked about in the past and we've kind of like laughed at is the idea of uh, how can we combine all of the, how can we provide services, like a one-stop shop service to the entire city. Uh, a derivative of this policy or proposal or a program is the OK or Trip card, which is the idea is that having a universal card a universal public transport card that you can use from buses to Angkots or minibuses and to various other, even taxi cabs, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea is to unify the various messy public transport system that we have so that people can easily hop from one mode of transport to another and potentially ease the traffic situation. But right now, the problem is not only is it hard to negotiate with various union leaders and the various uh, players in this program right like the the taxi cab union the bus union the Angkot union like all these people negotiated with them so that you can have this card function on their vehicles whether or not the technology can be scalable and functional for the millions of people the tens of millions of people that uses these services in Jakarta is still a question mark and a lot of people are saying again this is another sign of Anis proposing a sexy proposal without thinking about whether or not it's going to fix the problem of traffic. Mm -hmm. Is this the best solution to the problem of traffic? Probably not. You know, I don't think having a fancy, you know, tech card is going to fix the problem of the amount of cars, the amount of bikes that are on the roads and the lack of, you know, further road developments or widening roads that are happening. I just think, again, it's, it's naivety in terms of how he thinks he can govern and fix these real, real problems that, you know, former governors have not figured it out. So I don't think he's going to figure it out either. I think related to that as well, related to traffic, is this idea of um, having bechaks come back. What, how do you describe a bechak to a oh, it's such an Indonesian? It's such an iconic, but it's also a annoying. Traditional, um. <laughs> it's a traditional pedicab or cycle rickshaw found in Indonesia. And it's like, you have a bike or a motorbike that like has this little cart in the front for people to sit on and like go around essentially. So I like when I was when I was a kid, this was a perfectly acceptable mode of transport for us, and I very much liked it. True, but you're also hanging on. You're hanging on to your life, right? You're basically on top of the engine itself. It's hot. You're holding onto the door so it doesn't fly out, and you're not gonna fly out. It's like. You're basically riding a lawnmower. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to describe it. It's kind of it. great. It's pretty great. I actually rode one last year in Gorontalo, where it's still like a mode of transport. But now instead of people bike uh, using a bicycle, they use a motorbike. And like, man, and Gorontalo is a small, small city, right? Yeah, in Sulawesi. And like, I kept getting like debris in my eye. <laughs> 
<laughs> from like, because if you're on a bicycle, this is like a tangent. If you're on a bicycle, you're going slower. But now that it's like a motorbike, you're going fast, and there's like always gravel, like sh- sh- like hitting you in the face in any way. Um, yeah. But I have very fond memories of Vetchux in my childhood. But anyway, it was banned and under Sitioso's <laughs> previous governor Sitioso's term because it just created a lot more traffic and they like tried the the plan which Anis is trying to do which is allow uh, bed trucks only in certain areas which is not congested Anis is saying that because there's now Gojek and stuff um, the, the need for an actual bed truck is not that high anymore so they're just gonna be like a thing that tourists take for fun instead of like a then why then why is he bringing it back because it's a thing for if tourists it's not gonna actually uh. to yeah, for white people to ride around Jakarta in, you know? You, you know, you know what's also the reason, right? It's because he promised like the Betjak Union and its union leaders that we're gonna bring you guys back if you guys support us in the election. And right after he was elected, they basically, you know, showed up at his door and say, uh, "Fulfill your end of the bargain, please." Uh, great. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, and I mean. Like Stephanie said, right? Like I've also had fond memories of riding those death machines <laughs> when I was younger, and, and as as much as I would like them to come back for recreational and you know every once in a while purposes, I don't think they're a solution to the city's traffic problems. In addition to that, right? Like so, previous governor Ahok has worked very hard to improve traffic by clearing um, PKLs, Padang Kakilimas, or unauthorized vendors from selling on the street, like public streets where cars are supposed to go. And this policy has kind of like been disregarded under Anis, especially in Tana Abang, uh, a very popular central uh, market where there's also a big train station there. Um, yeah. And it's in the center of the city. Therefore, like traffic here, like has effects on the rest of the city. And so... Um, Anis went there recently and with Matanashwa on the camera and chaos ensues. Of course. <laughs> but essentially, in addition to that, there are rumors that the spaces that are supposed to be for registered unauthorized vendors have been sold by Satpal Pepe or the uh, people who are supposed to enforce Governor Anis's plans, which is great. More avenues for corruption. Ah, the the classic marker of functioning government here in Indonesia. <laughs> hmm. So I think, listeners, as you, I mean, we haven't even touched on some of the smaller campaign promises, such as the things you've said that he wants to do for women and protecting women and children and uh, victims of uh, domestic violence. All of those things have, you know, he hasn't touched any of those issues ever since he's got elected. So... Suffice to say that for those of us who were skeptical to begin with when he became the governor, we continue to be skeptical and we continue to be wary of the kind of policies and promises that he's making. And not to start off the year in a less than optimistic note, but hey, it's 2018. But I think it's important to like also observe Anis's actions, not in a vacuum, that he's positioning himself in politics to be kind of the antithesis to President, current President Jokowi, and that he's pursuing a very populistic line of like appealing to the masses and like making like promises that he may not be able to fulfill, but sound good to the people. Um, this is supposed to be contrasted to Jokowi's promises to also help people who are poor, but a lot of people are unhappy with the way he's been making policy or making inroads on this progress. Anis has also cultivated a role which, you know, he's been supportive of um, Aksi 212 or um, the more Islamic conservative faction in Indonesian politics with his... Um, 
hand on Habib Rizik's thigh, or was it Habib Rizik's hand on his thigh? It's my cover photo of my Facebook account, basically, since the last year, um, because I'm petty like that. Um, so check it out. Yeah, people who are not Indonesian <laughs> ask me, why are there two men on your cover photos? And I'm like... Let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, tangent. So yeah, he's been doing that for a reason. And, you know, this is not just us scrutinizing his few months in power, but just also as a way to measure how the 2019 elections will turn out. I think it's very clear from what he's doing that he's going to try pit himself and the other side of Jokowi's coalition will pit themselves as a side of the real pro-people who are more pro-conservative Islamic principles and probably quite supportive of the push towards criminalizing lgbtq relations and sex outside of marriage and all that stuff yeah all the passing the new criminal code that we talked about that stephanie talked about with naila in our previous episode and i think you know anis is also positioning himself as somebody that is the as you said anti jokowi right like he's the charismatic orator and jokowi is the pragmatic doer Part of me is observing that he's not going to ever publicly position himself yet as, you know, an alternative to Jokowi, but he wants to put himself in the best position to take advantage if anything happens, right? He wants to be in the heart of the masses. He wants to be popular with the masses so that if the opportunity arises, he can easily come to power. And I think a lot of parties are looking at Anis and sort of like kind of deciding who should we lend our support to? Is it going to be Jokowi, who is still popular? Or is it going to be Anis, who is increasingly becoming more popular? It's just really concerning. Jokowi has not said anything in order to protect or, you know... As people who are Indonesian and we care about Indonesian politics, we're pragmatic about what even somebody that is that is espousing a more progressive mindset as Jokowi can say, especially upcoming to an election year. So even though we would want to believe that Jokowi would want to govern in a more progressive way, I don't, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to keep a seat and continue down that path with people like Anis and Prabowo, who are much more gung-ho about going the conservative way and appealing to conservative leaders like uh, Habib Rizik to pull the masses in and counter the progressive wave, right? Yeah. So speaking of Habib Rizik, who is Stephanie's favorite person... (laughs) What is what is he up to, Stephanie? All right. Related to that, related to that, for my birthday present, he will be maybe potentially returning to Indonesia. <laughs> uh. So the way Indonesia writes down its like calendar, its date, month, and then year. So a big part of like Habib Rizik's entourage came down on Dua Satu Dua two years ago to protest a hawk right Mm -hmm. and the reason i think why the state is considered to remind people it it will be 21 2 again um by the time we air so it's like a opportune time for him to return and spread his message of hate in uh in the next year in order to further divide indonesia it's easy to hashtag 212 again right like keep it consistent this is like branding 101 right here <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes, his followers have been kind of like promoting that that if he comes back, he needs to everyone needs to come to the airport and like protect him and rejoice that he is back. And then the police are just like, "We will secure him." What does that mean? The aman gun. It's such an Indonesian word too. Like, it's not entirely clear what like the aman gun means. It means like. Uh, does it mean that they're gonna capture him? But does it also mean, or he they he, they will like make sure that he's just okay and then release him later? It's just such a vague word. That's just such an Indonesian political term. For those of us who are concerned about his return, it does not assuage our worries, right? Like, okay, he's back. He's a known extremist leader. He's known to espouse views and and give speeches that incite violence. It certainly divides the city. But apparently we're just going to like, quote unquote, aman kandia. It's like, what does that mean? Like, are we not going to tackle this issue of an extremist leader in our masses, in our midst, in an already divided society right right now? And so listeners, as you've listened to us rant for a while now about 
um, Anis's campaign promises and the future of what his administration is going to do and the potential return of Habib Rizik. We're going to keep our eyes peeled on what's happening over the next year and you know, we'll try to keep you guys as updated, keep ourselves as updated on what's going on in Jakarta right now as a microcosm to what's going to happen in Indonesia, not only in this year's regional elections, but especially in next year's 2019's presidential elections. Um, keeping our fingers crossed that democracy will win out Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find more information and resources of whatever we talked about on our website, dialica.id. Music credits to John Dealey, Lee Rosevere, and of course, Broke for Free. If you like what you hear and want to support us, please review our podcast on the Apple Podcast app or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. And please share our podcast with your friends. It's the best way to spread the word about Dialogica. If you want to get more involved, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is dialogicapodcast at gmail.com or just shoot us a message on our Facebook page. You can also find us on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and our Twitter. Please follow us in these various platforms. Our Twitter handle is at dialogicapod. Also, follow me on Twitter. It's Steph Tank. That's S-T-E-P-H-T-A-N-G-K. Thank you again and see you guys next time. Bye!